Okay, so it's yes. 11 a.m. here in Seoul, Korea. So good evening, everyone. Good good morning and good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining our event. Uh, okay, okay. I think Chris. I think so. Our first speaker, Jay, is here, and so I think we can start. Thank you very much. Okay, so I let me let me give you all a warm welcome. Thanks for coming, everybody. Um, I I'd like to introduce our first speaker, who is Jay Caprock tonight. Um, uh, Jay obtained. Uh, if you've read the if you've read the bio, the short bio, there's no way to make his biography short because he's done so many things in his life, um, published so many great works. Um, but he's his his work has always been in the. Um, the 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 public published works have been in applied mathematics, um, mainly in areas of physics and and chemistry. But he's also worked in the connection between art, science, and mathematics. And these are all um, these are subjects. These integrated subjects are are subjects that are uh, keen to the heart of this community. And um, we. We celebrate that and we, we look forward to hearing from Jay today. Um, so he, he, will, he will be bringing a, a little conversation uh, to us of, around his four books uh, on math and design and how they fit together to form a new mathematical pedagogy. It will be shown um, how the book, books fit together to form a new approach to mathematics. Each topic is accompanied by mathematical surprises and leads to designs while being based on sound mathematical principles and will show how large ideas come from humble beginnings. These ideas will be illustrated by topics from his new book, Geometric Foundations of Design, Old and New. Um, Jay, um, please uh, take the floor. Are you, are you set with your PowerPoint or do you need me to... Um, run that for you. After an introduction, I will follow by a PowerPoint presentation pertaining to my new book, Geometric Foundations of Design. Now, I'm the author of uh, the four books that, you, that are sitting beside me here. I will try to describe these books and show uh, that they form a new approach to mathematics. First, let me say something about the books. Uh, here is a, a connection with the first book to bring all the elements of mathematics of design together under one cover. Beyond Measure shows the presence of an ancient or very old themes. It also showed that there was a cultural and historical basis for this new discipline. This is a participatory approach to modern geometry, presenting an elementary approach to geometry, including projective geometry, which is the root of mathematics. And finally, geometric foundation to design shows how design motivates rich mathematical ideas. Now the work of writing Geometric Foundations of the Design began with my friendship with Slavic Dublin, a mathematician and artist from the University of Belgrade, now deceased. We had many mathematical adventures while he spent a semester on a Fulbright living near my home in South Orange, New Jersey, and working together. Slavic was both a scholar and a historian of geometry. In my books, I have attempted to show how old and ancient ideas capture the imagination and how each chapter contains mathematical surprises not widely known. I now focus on several ideas for my new book to give some idea as to what my approach entails. You will see in the book several chapters written by Ljana Radovich, Slavic student, who has carried on his work. 
But first, I would like to give you some idea as to how I began to work in this area of mathematics since I had little knowledge or expertise in the subject of geometry when I started. Well, in 1968, I found myself teaching at Cooper Union while getting my doctorate from NYU Koran Institute. It was there that I met Mary Blade, who had a doctorate in electrical engineering from the 1930s, a unique occurrence. And I taught, and taught mathematics in the mechanical engineering department to students from the College of Architecture. In addition, she was a musician, artist, sculptor, and mountain climber. I had never witnessed a course like the one she taught. When I walked into her office, I was met by all sorts of objects in the air and on the ground. She had been teaching a course in mathematics of design for 25 years, where her students created many two and three dimensional designs in the context of mathematics. Flash, flo flash forward to 1974. With a doctorate in hand, I was now teaching at New Jersey Institute of Technology, pursuing tenure by solving problems in plasma physics. A couple of years later, uh, with tenure now in hand, I felt that the time was right to try to replicate Mary Blade's ideas and to create a unique course in mathematics for architects. I found several colleagues at NJIT who were also interested in breaking new pedagogical ground for their students. I was joined by three faculty from uh, the School of Mathematics, three from the Department of Mathematics, two from the Department of Computer Science and a physicist. We met for a couple of months bouncing ideas off each other and came up with, with some exciting ideas for a course in mathematics of design. At the same time, students from the School of Architecture got wind of the excitement generated by the challenge of new ideas and volunteered for a non-credit course in math of design. The way we worked it was for a faculty member to present a, a lecture on some set of ideas that would be likely to stimulate the students' constructive instincts. The architecture students would then meet with their architecture faculty and create designs based on the lecture. The next week, we faculty were met with many exciting results. At this point, we knew that we had an unusual course in fact, the Dean of Architecture, School of Architecture requested that the course be required for all architecture students. We got approval from the university and I taught the first group. But we were faced by one additional obstacle. There was no test for such an unusual course for which the students would need many diverse books and references. To remedy this problem, I secured a grant to write a set of notes with one of my math colleagues, Dennis Blackmore. After teaching the course many times, I had enough material to create my first book, Connections. Since the course's beginnings, the, the uh, concepts have changed, particularly as new materials. Since the course's beginnings, the concepts have changed, particularly as new materials have been brought into use and as other faculty have added their ideas. This course has been one of the factors leading to other conferences, such as the Bridges Conference, to organize their own approaches to the subject of math design. In fact, the Bridges Conference has been held since 1997, and the word Bridges was taken from my book, Connection, the geometrical bridge between art and science. And I'm gratified by the many students and designers who have gotten their start and geometrical inspiration in mathematics and design by reading my books. Okay. I will never forget Mary Blade, now deceased. She would come to visit us at the end of each semester to admire the many student projects. 
Okay. Okay. Uh, I'm going to des describe the uh, pedagogy behind the course that we've, I've been teaching for many, many years. And the, there, here are the pedagogical levels. Most important, I found metaphor and creativity. The second importance, two and three dimensional design concepts. And then mathematical concepts of geometry and algebra were primarily used. And communications and literacy were very important. The pedagogical objectives were as follows. Topics are arranged into independent modules. A spiral module of learning is used rather than a linear model. Concepts return, concepts return in different contexts. Most topics are connected at different levels. Each module should contain significant mathematical content. The course addresses a variety of design ideas such as symmetry, symmetry breaking, duality, positive and negative space, mathematical constraints on space, nature of infinity, modular design, and say, et cetera. Algorithms to carry out design activities are emphasized rather than basic theory. Designs derived from different cultures, both ancient and modern, are emphasized. Most design activities are either adapted to the computer or are computer applicable. However, the first stage of the design process is generally hands-on or constructive. Materials are ungraded. They can be adapted to students from the third grade to students on the graduate level, both math mathematically oriented and non-mathematical students. The course emphasizes writing and communications. And here's how we evaluate the students, using scrapbooks, journals, design projects, homework exercises, essays, but no examinations. Okay, what I'd like to do to start off, I'd like to show you um, uh, some of the work of the students, uh, some of their, their projects, and you can see the level at which they're operating. Uh, here's someone who's creating a Barabell spiral, which is created from half squares. Here are some triangle circle designs. There's a Brunet star here. Uh, Tones, Tones Brunet was a, a, a Danish engineer who uh, was very much interested in construction of temples and um, and other things that were. I will describe some of the, some of his work in a moment. Uh, there are golden triangle designs. The golden mean uh, gives birth to two triangles, and these are designs created with the three two two. The golden mean triangles at three different scales. You'll notice how different the results are. There, uh, here's uh, a symmetry uh, example of fourfold symmetry. The tools to create this are sitting outside. Uh, these are Lunda designs, which if we have time, I would love to show you how, how they're created. Right now, now I can simply state that uh, if I go from left to right on one level, there are eight black squares. But any any level, any horizontal level will give me eight black squares. If I go up and down, I can get 11 black squares. Any, any movement up and down will give me 11 black squares. And these are created from uh, a grid of 16 by 22. We'll talk more about this later. 
here we have a uh, rectangle with tiled with nine congruent squares. No two squares have the same length. Here's a student who's created some op art. And uh, these are a bunch of stripes. Now, right now, it looks, it, it, this is made by uh, a, a rectangle with a, with a series of stripes, stripes on them. Uh, and I'll show you more about this in a moment. This is corresponds to the way uh, patterns were created back in uh, uh, ancient times, going back even 5,000 years. Here's a 12 pointed star, a square tiling. A tiling using the Sedgwick cut system. A, there are two, I found two great proportional systems a Sedgwick cut and also golden mean. And, the, these are the, and this is the sacred cut. There are rectangles of, there, there, there are, oh, sorry. Um, there's a square root rectangle. There are squares. And there are what I call Roman rectangles. Uh, mm. The, the Roman rectangle has uh, one by the silver mean. It's the silver mean is one plus the square root of two, the second most important number compared to the golden mean. And it has many additive properties, which is the reason why we're able to create a tiling like this. Uh, these are some attempts to create patterns of Amish quilts. The Amish quilt, many of the patterns of the Amish quilts were created by square root of two system, a square. And here are some more Amish quilts. And here are quoting here to tilings. Uh, I would, well, I will not go into them. They're created by a series of, uh, of points and each of those points are surrounded identically. Kufic tiling tiles are, uh, you, you start with a square and you put one stripe down the center of the square. And, okay. I would like to now get into some of the uh, topics in the course. We, we studied the brunette star in more detail. On the left-hand side, you'll notice that it, that it is an eight-pointed star. In the center, you'll, you'll see that there is a, a triangle uh, calls it attention to itself. And that triangle turns out to be a three, four, five right triangle. And then if you look further, you'll see that all the triangles are three, four, five right triangles or fragments of three, four, five right triangles. You'll also notice that the horizontal line is cut into four equal parts, but also at different levels, it's cut into one, two, three, all the way up to 12 equal parts. The seven equal parts is very special. And here is an arc, which is called a sacred cut arc. And it locates for us the height at which that horizontal line is cut into seven parts. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And here is a design involving the sacred cut. They make very nice designs when color, colorized or, or, or some other point of interest. Ah. Here, here we, we, we have an example of the ancient uh, uh, design. And we, we find that, that the Neolithic people, Neolithic people created ornaments uh, derived from primarily textiles. 
here's what a well-dressed Neolithic man will wear. Uh, and it's a ne Neolithic textile from Portugal on the left. There are three figurines over here, uh, also with uh, textile patterns. And they come from Serbia, uh, Hungary, and Romania, going back about 5,000 years. In the next figure over here, next figure, we find that uh, uh, a masterpiece of Mezin times, Mezin in the Ukraine. The birds of Mezin going back 23,000 BC. You also see that, uh, that there are um, con continuous ornaments at the next level continuous ornaments going from one ornament to the, to the other. This is a very sophisticated uh, uh, kind of design. Uh, and it's interesting to, to note that this would come so early, 23,000 BC. And here is a bracelet created from a mammoth bone. Looking on the right here, uh, we see the um, uh, ornaments from uh, Sheila Kledovi in Romania from 12,000 BC. And they are a modular tiling with a single square with stripes on it. See, all of these things have, have, have by the way, uh, can be created with squares with stripes on them. Uh, and in fact, those stripes or often signify war here. And here, all, everything here is created from this one tile. Here, these two are created from two tiles. You have a, uh, a gray and a red tile, gray and red stripes. And then you have where it's gray, it becomes red, and where it's red, it becomes gray. So you have an inverse uh, set of tile, tiling. And here's how we deal with it in class. On the left and the right, we have uh, a, uh, a square with uh, stripes on it, starting with a black, a black stripe, white, black, white, black. And then on the other side, it's the reverse. It's white, black, white, black. And so you need both of these tiles to, to do complete tiling. The ones going up and down are used for op art. So here's the op art on the left. And here is the uh, tiling created from a simple, single, from a pair of squares with stripes on them. And now on, if you look on the right, you'll see uh, a spiral. The spiral, by the way, is for, has to be is formed by uh, 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 adding, putting the tile on top of itself. Well, I'm sorry, I'm not being clear. But uh, there are two squares here. You can notice, notice there are two squares uh, lightly drawn. And if they are turned at 90 degrees to themselves, out comes the, on the left, the labyrinth. And this is the famous uh, labyrinth of the Minotaur myth with, with uh, Theseus and Ariadne. Now, this is a Kufic tile. At least that's what Slavic named this a Kufic tile. And uh, if you color the interior black, and leave this right, you have a, a square with a black stripe, one black stripe. Over on the right, if you color this black and leave this white, you have a, another color, uh, another uh, uh, tile with a, uh, uh, a single white stripe. What's so interesting about these are that they can be used for creating writing. 
often they were used for, to create the name Allah. Here, but here, here's a, a, just a, some hint as to how this is done. You're creating writing. And I'll show you one example of writing. This is the uh, uh, girlfriend of the, of, of the student that I did a lot of design work with. And her name is Lily. Okay. So now we're going into another area, which is kites and darts. Uh, these were uh, uh, created, uh, popularized uh, back in 1978 by, uh, um, uh, I am blocking on his name. <laughs> okay. Uh, they are created from golden mean, the golden mean, uh, this is a kite, and this is, a, I'm sorry, this is a dart, and this is a kite. And the kite and the dart have red lines drawn on them, positioned by the golden mean, or blue lines. And whenever you, you juxtapose to a, a kite and a dart, you... Uh, juxtapose them so that the blue line meets the blue line and the red line meets the red line. Here are three examples created by the, the name of the person I was thinking of. Martin Gardner, a very famous designer, design mathematician. So here are three of his examples. And here's one example from my class. This student has cleverly decided to, to create the entire uh, uh, um, tiling, but, at, but then remove the blue and red lines. And he ended up with this very wonderful composition. Non-periodic tilings can be also created with something called a bobbin, which is so sh shown in red, and a bow tie in blue. And you'll notice that three bobbins and one bow tie form a decagon. And here are a whole bunch of decagons surrounding a region and space. And that region and space, and the, the, we have a, a conjecture, not proven yet, that Whenever you can surround a, a, a region by uh, decagons, you can always tile them by bobbins and bow ties. And here they are. On the right side, another student project of this type. Ah, here is a wonderful design that was created by a student from my class. It was so wonderful that I decided to use it for the cover of my geometry book. I like this cover, this, this design. Now we come to another area called fractals. And fractals play a big part in, the, in our course. Uh, here we have a simple line segment and a line segment with a little bump on it. The bump is the same dimensions as, as the lines, as the line segments. Every, every line, every linear segment has a little, little, a little bump or a bridge. And much later, later state of the design, you'll see over here that it, uh, uh, they are self-symmetric. If you take the, the entire result, resulting design, uh, it will have the same structure as, as a small part of itself. The same thing works over here with the, 
uh, with uh, uh, a, a tree, a tree diagram. And from the tree, some, we, we take one, two, three, four, five branches. In each of those five branches, we, we add five more branches. So now we have 25. Here we have five more branches, so we have 125 branch ends. If we continue doing this, we end up with something that looks like a real Anselmus tree, but it's it's only computer model. The same thing can be done with a starting with a line, line segment. We can end up at the, with a broccoli, a head of broccoli. And head, head, if you go into a supermarket and look at a head of broccoli, you'll notice that the uh, uh, each little piece of the, bro of the broccoli looks like the whole. The same thing can be done with a moonscape. And so here we have a meteor has just struck the moon, causing a little circular dugout. And if you, if from that circular dugout, you get eight small models. And from each of those eight small models, you get eight more smaller models. You begin to get something that looks like a real, a, a real uh, a lunar, lunar moonscape. And the, on the right here is a photograph of a moonscape looking almost exactly like the fractal version. Again, starting with a, a simple line segment and doing the same thing over and over again, this time we're getting a right angle and attaching it to A and B. Now we're having another right angle going out and one going in, and one going out and one going in, and one going out and one going in. Keep doing this thing over and over again, we end up with the wonderful dragon curve. Now, this is something that I've done with students in my class, but also I've done it at the British Conference with, and uh, with uh, a couple of 10-year-old 10 10 year kids came, came in and were able to carry this out. A fractal world wall hanging. It seems it might seem a little complicated at first. Um, you start you, you start with a uh, square, uh, and uh, the transformations that we consider are the uh, symmetries of a square. And we take the, the layer P, which has no symmetry, and apply the transformations to that layer P. So here it's a, uh, a counterclockwise 90 degree turn. Here it's a uh, 180 degree turn, which is the same as turning it upside down. If I turn the, the P upside down, I get this figure. Uh, uh, this one is a uh, um, a uh, a, a vertical and, and, and a horizontal um, reflection, vertical and horizontal, and there are two more. Uh, that, that based on the diagonals of a square. These are all the transformations that keep the square, change the, the, the points within the square, but keep the square exactly unchanged. And from this, I can create something very unusual. I can put the P in this little one by one box and then introduce another transformation, which is, which is a contraction, to contraction to half the size. And in that, in that contraction to half the size, I have four little boxes, and I can create a design based on 
this one, which is a upside down, turn, turn the P upside down. Here, here uh, uh, rotate the P 90 degrees, and here, leave that P alone on top. I can then take this dot box and, and cut that into half, just like I did the other one. And the one on the right always gets turned upside down. One on the left is a, um, uh, a uh, 90 degree counter counterclockwise turn. The one on the top is left alone. It's like the exact design that it was originally. And if we keep on doing this over and over again, once again, we, we see, we, we get this for a result. And then we get this no matter what I used. If I didn't use the layer P, but use a simple black box, this would be the exact, the exact result I would get at the end. And from this, this is a, this, I can replace this in a two by two, two inch square. And I can use the, uh, those three transformations. I can take it, I can uh, rotate it 90 degrees counterclockwise and put it on the left. I can leave it alone. Model of exactly this. I can do that again and again and again. I can end up with a, um, a fractal wall painting of whatever size you like. And we were able to do this in a one hour class uh, in the Bridges Conference, and we got ended up with a beautiful uh, wall hanging. Uh, here's a curve of constant width, which is uh, something I had not uh, seen for quite some time. And um, it came out of, a, out of a, uh, uh, some pages written by Martin Gardner. And what do I mean by constant width? Well, I, I could take a, par a line here and then a parallel line. Move those the, move those parallel lines uh, inward until they touch the curve, and take them and then measure the distance, and then try a different uh, uh, set of parallel lines, and do the same thing. And if you find the distance is the same no matter which orientation you start with, then you've got a curve of constant width, like for example an automobile bill tire. So uh, auto, automobile wheels are not the only thing that that uh, uh, is able to uh, roll. But these curves of constant width roll just as well as a wheel. They can serve as a wheel. Here they are smoothed out and over here we have another, it turns out that from any set of three linear straight lines, I can create a curve, non-symmetric curve. Looks slightly awkward, but it rolls just like a wheel. Okay, here, and now we're... We're, okay. Okay. We're okay. I think we're probably at the end, near the end of the. Uh, yes, we're right. Yes, Do you have about five minutes so we can have a few so minutes, for have questions. minutes for questions? Five, five minutes would be fine. Uh, this is a uh, something created by the module by the the it's called the modular of the Le Corbusier. Le Corbusier was a 20th century French architect. Uh, and he has a sequence, a geometric sequence. Um, it turns out that, that the sequence also has additive properties. If I take these two, I get this. If I take these two, I get this. These two, I end up with the next. Uh, these are, this is called a Fibonacci series, by the way, when, when you have that property. 
what, what Felix Bouzier did was to, was to create a, a, a pair of, of scales, a blue scale and a red scale. Uh, by the way, the, the, uh, it's interesting that if you take the, uh, the red, red uh, uh, length and put it in, in, in the intermediate between the upper two, you end up with the, with the arithmetic mean. And if you took this figure, this length up here on the upper one, and brought it down to the gap in between at the, at the bottom, you end up with the harmonic mean of these two. And of course, any, any one term is the geometric mean of the one before it and the one after it. And here, oh, I should have mentioned that uh, he created this from a six foot British policeman with his hand held over his head. So here's the British policeman. And here is the, the length corresponding to his hand held over his head. And here's a, has a, uh, an example how, how it looks. I will end, end up with uh, maybe just the last thing, which is to show you that you can take the red scale, create a bunch of rectangles by taking the, the red scale and the red scale, so length and width. Or you can take the blue scale and the blue scale for length and width, or, or a length from the blue and a width from the red. When you do that, you end up with, well, here's an example of a, of a, of a, of a um, tiling of one, two, three, four, five, six. These are one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. These are identical. They have a identical components, but uh, they are uh, all different. Uh, this is unusual, and this is uh, this is what we have. The, this is the value of uh, uh, the value of, of having uh, additive properties. Uh, if it didn't have additive properties, if you found one tiling of these six pieces, you would never find another one. And so this, this follows from the golden mean. And by the way, here is a building, Unite Habilitation, uh, using this system to construct it by uh, uh, Le Cabutier. Okay, well, I'm probably at the end here. I was going to talk about the sacred cut and uh, which is very interesting. I'll, I'll, I'll run through the, maybe just run you through the slides without saying anything. Uh, here's this, that sacred cut over here and four of them form a uh, octahedron. And I, I, I can tile a square with them uh, using the square root rectangle, the square and the Roman, re Roman rectangle which is one by one plus the square root of two. Uh, 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 Brunes found, Tones Brunes found th this, uh, this tapestry sitting in uh, a house in, um, in Herzegovia and pumping in Herzegovia. And uh, so, and here's how here how the here's how the additive properties work. It's, I, I unfortunately have not, not time to talk about it, but they they do lead to interesting tilings. Uh, once again, the the only tiles are the three species: the square root tile, the square, and the uh, Roman rectangle. This is the Roman rectangle, one by and. and and there, once again, is uh, a. If you you, you tile tile the curve, tile the square in one one way. If if there were no additive properties, you'd never find another way. Since they do have additive properties, you'll notice that I, I can come up with. This is exactly the same species of, of as on the left. 
Okay. So that's Jay, I think we'll, 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 we'll have to. We'll have to. And that's it. Have to break there. Have to break there. Fine. Are there questions, Are there questions for, for for Dr. Capra? Dr. Capra. Oh, they must be. <laughs> I can think of a few. Do you go there? You there, go are. there. There are. It just takes time, just for, takes people time to, for people to. Sure. Get brave. Get brave. If you could turn if your you volume, turn down, your just volume down just a little. Just a little. Okay. Well, I can I can speak softer. <laughs> No, it's no, it's there's bleed over bleed from over my from my from your speaker from your into your speaker into uh -huh. oh oh yeah everybody's yeah, muted everybody's so it, muted so it, oh, oh yeah, that's why we're not getting questions right right uh Jake uh, please, Jake, type, please your, type your type your question type your or, question or you could probably you speak could probably speak. Uh, I can uh, uh, this this last slide over here is is uh, is full of unusual things. Let uh, me put it. Up. Let me put it up. The uh, last one. The last one. I went too far. I went too far. The one with I, I, the one I, with I, I can ask away. Ask away. Ask away. Uh, Jay, I uh, could Jay, keep up I with you keep about up with you about the, end of the time. End of the time. Okay, that's pretty I good. Need I need to take your class. Okay. Mm -hmm. That was quite, that was quite remarkable. Deep, 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 deep corners of my brain that had been, been reached for a long reached time. For a long time. <laughs> I just really don't have a, yes, don't have a, a question other than. Yeah, and racing like how that, do you, I how still. Do keep up with you? I don't. Well, I don't. I don't, get I don't get it. Well, it, it becomes a lot easier when you have the time. I mean, if if, if we sat down for a cup of coffee and. Uh, uh, I'd be able to to show you confidently any of the things we talked about. I talked about today. Well, the problem well, is, is 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 time and 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 sure. Sure. it's a trade off as to whether you want to get see what, what what was really being done in the in the class without having to rep. You don't, no, no one's asking you to replicate it, but uh, it's, yeah. it's it'd be good to, to to see some of the extent of the work. Uh, these are students who are generally math phobic who uh, who take this course, and m many of them. Uh, and the the idea is to try to make them feel comfortable with what they're doing. Well, when you first well, started, when you first I, started thought, well, I thought, "Well, I'm getting back." And then it, and then it slowly, it slowly sank, into my, sank head, into my head, and you captured it, captured it, captured it. I'm kind of stunned. Kind of stunned. <laughs> it's quite a, it's yeah. quite, a, quite a display. Quite a display. Thank, you Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, Thank you, Jay. Thank we you, Jay. We, we, we appreciate your, 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 your giving your, your time, giving to, us time and to us. And we ask, we ask that maybe that if you would maybe now if turn, you would off now your turn off your microphone, your microphone and, and we're, we're, we're going to move to okay to Jake. That, that looks great. Okay. Um, I'm assuming everyone can hear me with some, if you give me, if you can hear me, give me one little wave. At the, okay, thank you. Um, so, uh, Jay was, that was a fabulous, fabulous presentation. Thank you very much. And um, if we could, you know, just thank you, round of applause very much for your contributions to the time and uh, I apologize for the uh, little technical difficulties we are having with audio and so on, but we finally got it to work, and it was it was a pleasure to um, to sit in your class and to be to have our appetites whetted 
Um, so let's do that again. Is it all right with you that we share this PowerPoint? Oh, I think Jay is. Um, uh, I, well, well, we'll find out later and we'll, we'll try and make that PowerPoint um, available. I know it was requested. Um, but now um, I'd like to, um, to, to introduce our, our next speaker, um, Stephen Jacobs, who likes to call himself Jake the Wizard number four, um, comes to That's us. Right. At, he's, he's, the, he's a retired college professor, a scientist, educator, author, and media personality with uh, several university degrees of his own. Um, and nearly two decades of teaching experience. And he, he told me the other day he's been in literally thousands of schools around the world. Um, and his, his television, television credits, credits are, are include being include on Nickelodeon, on Nickelodeon National, Geographic, National Geographic, uh, NASA TV, uh, Paramount, Fox Television, Disney, National Public Radio, and the Smithsonian Institution. Um, and he's currently the chief scientist um, to Discovery Channel and Faraday Labs. And um, he's, he has a, has a pedigree that goes clear back to Faraday himself. And we're just kind of also, it's a, it's a night of giants tonight. And um, Jake, please. Take over. Okay, yeah, that's uh, wow us. Can you can me, hear me? Okay, uh, Chris. Yes, hear you just fine. Am I on? Let's start it with a little clip. Are you ready? A little clip. Here it is. And now for something completely different. Okay, thank you very much. Here we go. Thank you now for something <laughs> completely different. It's time for everybody to wake back up. I know it's uh, what time is it here? It's ten at night, and some people are at four in the morning. Uh, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. For let is Christoph with us today? He is. He he's, he uh, happens to be out in the in the middle of a of the woods, though, because it's so early in the morning. Oh, where he's at. There he is. No, I I am so very upset. Now we just had the most wonderful thing from from Jay, and uh, now we're doing something completely different. Um, I'm look at me. I am very upset. I've had a bad day, bad week, bad month, and I could not think of a better group of people, all, all the groups that I associate myself with. I love this group of people. Mr. Park's friends, I don't know what this group is. This is an amazing group. So I'm just gonna throw myself, I brought my own agenda tonight to throw on this group. Normally, a speaker would present their work and, and would share it with us, uh, a project they've done, spent their life's work. This is what Jay did. How many, how many years did he put into those four books? Oh, my gosh. And I've worked on many, many projects in my 50-some year career. And uh, I'm doing my last one. But I'm just starting it. So I don't have a finished product to share with you. As a matter of fact, I thought I was going to quit and retire. And then I got so upset. That I got, I said, no, I've got to do this one more project. So I, I, I thought, who are the smartest people I know? Some of the smart, it's Mr. Park's friends that I meet, see once a month. And I said, I'm just going to impose some questions on you. I'm going to reverse the table tonight. I'm going to ask you for your input instead of me giving you all of mine. I need your help. So first thing I want to do is... tell you who I am. Show a little video. Of, this is what I'm doing right now. This, I just want to show you a little video. I, I do a lot of video. Show that start video. So here, here it is. Midnight Science Club offers a backstage pass to science. Get access to a global community of practicing scientists, live streaming shows, on-demand video content, and more. Founded on a tradition of groundbreaking scientists, considered wizards of their day. This only lasts a minute, but we're all right.
Isn't that a sweet little baby, Midnight Science Club? Now, I, we're trying to popularize science just like Mr. Wizard did. I come from, a, like, like a, uh, you mentioned, uh, it's a, quite a long pedigree. Do we have a picture of the four, of four wizards, by the chance, by the way? Can you throw one up, Scott? There's, there are the four wizards. I want you to meet the wizards. Now, there's Faraday, my great-great-grandfather, I guess. He was, uh, Queen Victoria called him wizard, which meant the wisest one. And you know, you know the story of Faraday. They say he would have had four Nobel Prizes had they had those back then. And a very devout man and a popularizer of science, the first great science communicator. And he, Victoria called him wizard and let him move into Hampton Court when he retired from the Royal Institution. And uh, along comes uh, Wizard 2. I'm, I'm cramping this together. We've only got a few minutes. Uh, uh, Allier, Hubert Allier, a chemist at Princeton, uh, Walt Disney made a movie about him in the uh, 60s called The Absent-Minded Professor. And he was uh, a chemist. His next door neighbor, by the way, in, in, on the, near the Princeton campus was Albert Einstein. That'd be a rough neighbor to have living next door, I guess, but he lived next door to Einstein. And Allier taught me chemistry uh, half a century ago or you know, more, whatever it was. He was wizard too. And he spoke around the world at the World's Fair and Walt Disney saw him at the World's Fair speaking and made the movie about him, the absent-minded professor. And, uh, Allier passed the torch to the guy there in the center, Don Herbert, who was on television for 51 years. And he did four, 14,000 uh, programs over 50 years of different varieties. But the one he was most best known for was Mr. Wizard. And I watched him uh, 65, I don't know, a long time ago, 70 years ago, something like that, whenever I started watching Mr. Wizard. And then in 95, they passed it, for some strange reason, they passed the wizard a title to me in London at the Royal Institution, and I've got Sir Humphrey Davies' walking staff, and, and all this was, a, uh, of course, copied with uh, uh, Harry Potter, the Harry Potter series that children love around the world was about Michael Faraday and his life as a scientist. Of course, they switched it over to, to music and stuff, I mean, over to us, to magic and that sort of thing. So what I, I just want to tell you who, who we are and what we do for a living, and I would actually do some demonstrations now, but I'll, I'll do those at the end if we get to it. So I want to start a slide set that we've got here. You don't have to change it, uh, Chris. We'll, we, we can do it here. Great. I want you to understand uh, why I'm so upset, because I've been in this business for 50 years, being a science educator, been active in all the social group, uh, professional groups that many of you are involved in, NSTA, the, the, the AAAS, the uh, National Academies of Science, and I've been members of those, place, uh, those groups and uh, been working on written books and programs and all sorts of things. I want to go through this deck real quick with you, and then I want, you'll find out why I'm so upset tonight before I get to my project. So let's start the deck real quick. What do we got? Uh, go on past, skip that. We know we're there. That's it, Faraday Studios. And that's Father Faraday, and there's our, our guest house, and that's our office. That's where I work out of right there. Okay, move on. And those are some of the networks I work for, Discovery, and I wrote Mythbusters for 13 years and had a show on Nickelodeon, and I don't know. I've worked on about 22. There's our group, and I'm the handsome guy there at the left, so we've got a group of scientists to work here at Faraday Studios. And what we do is we produce uh, science programming for all sorts of science production companies and for the Smithsonian and for Discovery Channel and National Geographic. And here we are doing our thing, uh, doing all sorts of science things. We run science competitions, the Discovery Channel Young Scientist Challenge, ICEF, we do a bunch of stuff. Uh, that's what we do, keep on going there. And I, we have an advisory council uh, of people. Now, uh, we just lost uh, Leon Lederman, but we have several Nobel Prize winners on our advisory council. And uh, there's Dean Kamen, the, uh, the great inventor and windbag of all times, and a bunch of really smart people. And our goal is to, to teach young people how to think like a scientist. That's it. That's, that's my task. How do I teach young people uh, around the planet to think like a scientist? That's what we do. Now, I want to review something very quickly. This is just the pedagogy that, that I, as I understand it, 
we have a 225-year uh, pedigree. is kind of cool. I've never thought of it as a pedigree. But Faraday started this in 17... The Royal Institution was founded in 1795. And there's, there's the theater at the Royal Institution. And all science was pretty much communicated to the public with lectures. That was about the only way to communicate. Most people didn't own books. They would lecture. And lecture, lecture, you lectured at school. You went to church, you got lectured. The Royal Institution, Faraday gave lectures that were very famous. And lectures were the way. That's what they did. Everybody lectured. And, in, and we were lectured up until about the middle of the 50s. All the classrooms that were built in the United States and universities were lecture theaters. So we learned our science from lectures. And in about 1950, when the space race started, and we, were, and we were way behind, we thought, in science. And we did start science fairs back in the 50s. Well, it was earlier than that. We had science fairs. But what, what was the next big step in science education right after the 1950s? It was hands-on science. And I, that's when I came into the picture. Being a teacher was in the hands-on phase. Let's see if I can keep up with my uh, picture here. And what happened after hands-on science? That was around about, oh, t 11 years. Well, then we started to get, get topical. When Jimmy Carter became president, it was energy. We, it was man and energy. So energy and all the, all the popularized uh, things started entering into the world of science education. You know, pollu uh, pollution, environment, all good stuff. But it started to creep in to hands-on, which was great. And then what happened in the 80s? The big push. Everybody focused on science standards. We need science standards because schools weren't doing so well. For some reason, they were not starting to do as well. And America's rating in, in, in the world of science education was sinking. And we said, we need, we, well, we need some science standards, by golly. And what happened in the, ni in the 90s? Well, we need more science standards. But we're, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna get into the scientific inquiry cycle. We, we started to analyze what's going on. And we spent billions of dollars, studied, studied, and the Department of Education expanded. Uh, what happened in this? We got more science standards. You think we'd have enough, but no, no, we got more. And what happened in the in the in the 2000? We had more science standards. My God, I, how many committees did I sit on developing new science standards? 2010 comes. What do we got? Well, we need more. And we created this thing called STEM. Where did STEM come from? I don't know. So I asked my committee just the other day, uh, where do we stand? And th this was the other day, uh, five years ago. I said, what? we've got all these standards, yet most of our schools are not performing well in science education, and we're struggling, and we keep sinking down the list. What are we now, 85th on the planet? I don't remember what it is, but it's not, it's not good. What's the problem? Well, my, my team suggested two things. Two things are the problem. Hurry sickness. Our children are try to get too much done. Everything's done fast. Everything's processed fast. They do not know how to use the skills of thinking as a scientist because everything's done for them at a breakneck speed. They suffer from hurry sickness. And then we have them ask them to come into a science classroom where we want them to pause and consider and measure things carefully and observe and predict and analyze and do research. and say, I'm not going to do that. What am I going to do? Go to the next slide. I have technology overload. That's, that's where our children spend. How much time do they spend doing this, having their thumbs on a screen? It's an incredible amount of time. The average amount of STEM education in the United States as of two weeks ago, calculated by the National Academy's call for action, was 20 minutes a day. The average kid in the U.S., forget COVID and all that's acting, 20 minutes a day is in STEM education. That's the average in elementary school, 20 minutes. What are you going to do in 20 minutes? We have technology overload. So, and you've heard this before, what's the answer to hurry sickness and what is the answer to technology overload? Well, 
teach a kid to play a musical instrument and get them back using their hands. I visited the Montessori Day School in um, Morristown, New Jersey recently to spend a week as a visiting scientist and they paid a hefty salary to get me there. And I sat down with a group of 40 fourth and fifth grade boys and I was going to recreate Faraday's chemical history of a candle for them. And I bought out, brought out a box of kitchen matches to light this candle. And there were 40 children in this room that had no idea what this was. They'd seen a match, but they'd never operated a match. There were 40 boys that had a blazer on in a fancy school in Morristown, New Jersey. And when I lit this match, they, they this, oh, they were, oh, oh, it was like cavemen seeing fire for the first, and I lit, how many of you have lit, lit a match? And none of them, as you've lit a match before. No, I haven't. Mother would not allow that. So instead of doing the lecture, I gave them each a handful of matches and let them go out on the playground and see what, well, how, they, how, how to light a match. I discovered that day that these brilliant kids who could do wonders on the computer, and they weren't dumb kids by any means, they could not operate a roll of tape, a screwdriver, they could not operate scissors. I cut out some paper dolls out of a newspaper and pulled it in, and they freaked out. How did you learn to do that? Where, where today would a 10-year-old boy use a pair of scissors in his life? Doesn't even know if there's scissors around the house or not. Much less use them. They don't use scissors anymore or screwdrivers much. They really don't. They don't have much access to it. What's the next slide there? We can throw that second. So what I've been doing for the last two or three years is involving ourselves and show us that's what are we still doing? We're still doing workshops. Go ahead, Scott, do this slide. Uh, we've traveled in the last four or five years, we've traveled, I don't know, to almost every continent, testing what I'm getting ready to present. We've presented in Saudi Arabia, and we even came and visited Mr. Park uh, uh, oh, two or three years ago. I've been to England and Scotland. We've been all over the place doing workshops, and we've put together products that have won awards. The number one selling kit in the United States uh, three years ago was Science Magic, that, that, that toy fair. That was the number one selling kit, kids wanting to do science projects. So, and we've been doing teacher workshops, trying to gather them for, to, to answer the question, what can we do to turn the tide in science and STEM, science STEM, science and STEM education in the United States? Now, I, I set on this old guy you're looking at sets on the world's largest collection of science activities and demonstrations. We have over 20,000 that Faraday started 200 years ago, and they were passed on to Hubert Allier at Princeton and Don Herbert, and now they reside with me, and hopefully there'll be another wizard here in a few years, because I, I do I desperately want to tire. I've got, we've got all, we've got access to a science activity on any topic you can think of. We've, I've got that right here. Here we are. So what am I going to do? What am I proposing to do? And why am I so upset? Well, here, do, the reason I'm so upset and then what I'm going to do. Okay, do we have the so, so I just attended. I want you to look carefully what I'm saying, because I'm knowing I'm going to get in trouble for sharing this with you. I know. But there it is. The National Academy's call for action in science education. This is it. They're going to recommend this to President Biden here shortly. This, this book is not out yet. You can order it, and they're printing it as we speak. Their call for action. And I don't know where else we can go except to the National Academy's Board of Education. They looked at STEM. They spent, I don't know, a year has it been a year saying, we've got to do something new? And I sat through the, the ceremony with this for four days, listening to the call for action. And I want, you, I want to share with this group of people the three 
actions that they are calling us to do. This is the answer that our, the U United States government, and here they are, action number one, elevate the status of science education. Well, that just really got me going. I, I'm so excited about that one. Number two, establish local and regional alliances for STEM opportunity. Oh, that's brilliant. I, who would have thought of that one? I don't know how much money we spent coming up with these three actions. And by all means, uh, document progress to, towards better, more equitable science education. That's a beautiful thing. I know, I, I know we have a problem in that area, but those, that's the call to action. Now, I don't know how long each of you have been involved in STEM education. I don't know if we added up the number of years of the people on this meeting, it would have to be centuries of time spent trying to teach math, science, engineering, and helping kids learn it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what my government just put out as the call to action. And I wanted to go hang myself. I got so upset. I said, that's it. And when that book comes out, I hope you get it and look at it. And you'll say, this is, uh, I won't say nonsense, but I'm, I'm so tired of hearing it. I've heard that one of the teachers on the, on the, on the panel with me said, I, I could have written this report in my sleep. I've heard this so many times. So I, now I'm going to stop. That's why I'm upset. After 50 years doing what we do well, uh, and I'm here I am griping to you, this beautiful group of people. I, I didn't know who else to gripe to. So I just said, I'll pick on Mr. Parks, friends, to, gripe, to, to yell at for a moment. Now I've got it off my chest. I feel a lot better. Thank you for letting me vent. So I just vented. So now, so what is this wizard going to do with this asset that has been bestowed on me? Okay, put up the slide with the Swiss Army knife. Hopefully, a year from today, I will have this product finished. But what I'm going to do with a group of, of wonderful science educators and professors and people at NASA and all this group of people we've put together, we're going through this collection of 20,000 activities and we're picking out 200. I'm calling it the Faraday 200. And the Royal Institution is signed on as a partner in this adventure because this is the year they're celebrating the 200th anniversary of Faraday's development of the electric motor. So they're celebrating Faraday 200 for a separate, separate reason that what we're doing is we are going to get 200 activities, and I'll demonstrate one here for you in a minute, 200 activities that we will give, start giving to fourth grade students. I think that fourth, third and fourth grade, but especially fourth grade, all the pedagogues that I've heard from and read about in the science stand suggest that there are three trending points in a young person's life. It's the fourth grade, 10 years old, eighth grade, 13 years old, and their junior year in high school. And if you, have to, you only have so much ammunition or so much money, where should you target your efforts? And it's with fourth grade kids to eighth grade. So we're going to provide to every kid on the planet or make it available, that's our goal anyway, an activity every week for four years. Some of the neatest science activities, STEM activities that when a kid sees them, they go, oh my gosh, I got to do that right now. I have to do this. Stop, stop everything. I've got to do this. Every year for four, every, uh, once a week for four years, by the time the kid gets to the eighth grade, the student reach, reaches the eighth grade, they will have practiced all the science, basic science process skills while they're having one heck of a good time. And it doesn't matter if it happens in a classroom, if it happens at a Boy Scout meeting, if it happens at home school or with parents doing it with their kids. I did, we just want these 200 activities to be done by every kid on the planet. And we're going to make them available on all platforms. Uh, PBS wants to do a TV series, or we're going to put it on all social media. We're, we're going to print books. We're going to make kits. Uh, and each activity will support, not replace, but support existing curriculum standards. And this next one, this continual uh, titivation, uh, 
was I was inspired by the gentleman who shared his book at the last meeting that they changed the cover on it every month or every week and how that is a living, changing book that keeps growing. And I thought I was so inspired by that book with 100 uh, essays in it. I said that, that inspired me for this, that wh what we're building will change as people experience some of the activities. They'll share with us better ways to do it, uh, to improve it, to edit it, so it will continually be growing. It'll be a live functioning uh, presence, the that, that Faraday 200. And we're going to make it with the highest production values, which means they won't let me produce any of it. Uh, I don't, I'm not known for my high production values, but it will be done that well. And I wondered if this was a good idea. So I shared it with a few people at the National Academies and around. Well, lo and behold, about two months ago, or maybe three months ago, the United Nations picked it up as as the impact partner for their SDG program, the 17 Sustainable Goals. So we are going to be an impact partner in goal number four for education. And they like it because we've been, we're being introduced to corporations uh, to be, for sponsorship. I've asked for $23 million over four years uh, $100,000 for each one of the activities to develop the video and the, the, the authorship of, of the, uh, all the printed materials and building the web presence and $3 million for the setup to get it, to get it all put together. And uh, we, we've been given contact so far with, uh, there's 18,000 corporations who have signed on to support the SDG pro program. And so far, we've talked to uh, Sony and Coca-Cola and McDonald's and T-Mobile. And uh, Coca-Cola just said the other day they're going to put in $2 million. And so it, it's a long ways to raise the 20-some the million dollars. But the idea, the, so I've got a year and a half. This old wizard has a year and a half to get, uh, we're not going to get all 200 done. Maybe we'll get 50. We're going to grow the program over the next four years. But... What I need, what, that's where I'm at. And, and can you show this picture of the fireman? The, 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 you had the, the slide of the fireman. My father was a fire captain. And you look at that fire, he would come up, pull up to a fire like that, and he was in charge. And he'd, he'd see a roaring fire like that, and he'd, everybody would look to him and say, we have this terrible fire going, what do we do? Where do we squirt the water? What do we do? And you look at that fire right there. That's the way a teacher might feel going into a classroom unprepared to teach STEM. So they say, I don't know. There's so much pressure to get that fire out. And there's so much pressure to be an effective STEM teacher. How do you, how do, you do it? And how do we attack this fire that's burning in, in the STEM education world? You need a good fire captain. And there, there's, that's not my dad, but that's what he did. He would direct the flow. And he would often say these terms, this word to me. He would get in there and yell at the firefighters, you're working the wrong end of the fire. He had to figure out where to put that precious water. You're working the wrong end of the fire. And what I saw at the National Academies was a bunch of brilliant people, a group of brilliant minds, working the wrong end of the fire. They were trying to build this big, uh, I don't know what to call this effort, this governmental effort, but they were not, they didn't, I don't even know how to vocalize it. They're not putting the water on the right part of the fire. They're spending, they're going to spend hundreds of millions of dollars trying to do it yet another set of science standards and another set of programs, and they're not addressing the core or the governing dynamic of science learning, but they're 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 gonna it's gonna be a, a beautiful piece of procedural uh, developmental work. So what we're looking to do is, as my father taught me, he said, find the governing dynamic of that fire and put your effort there. I'm gonna put my effort into 200 activities 
that every kid on the planet will want to do over a four-year period. And uh, what I'm going to ask of you, I asked this of Chris the other day when I talked to him about it. I said, I'm going to need the help of people like you. So I want to do one activity here in a minute. Do I have time for it? How am I doing on time, Chris? You're doing all right there, Jake. Is everybody awake? I don't know. I'm looking at like zombies there. I don't know. It just, now we're here. We're, all we're here. Keep going. Listen, guys, I don't know. I don't necessarily know what I'm doing, as you can tell. I'm getting out, out of my depth. But after, after listening to the National Academy's pa panel talk for, forever, I said, no, no, no more. No more of that. We've got, we've got to get those kids. So I want to show you one activity. Please. And then, can I do that? Yes. Okay, Chris is there. Here's one activity. I want to give you an idea of, this is just one. So here, here it is. These activities have to be inexpensive. Nobody's got any money. So th this, here's a laser pointer. You zoom in on that thing. There's a laser pointer. Now, we've done it with, you go to the 7-Eleven or the local convenience store, they have these little little laser pointers that cost a dollar, all right? You take the laser point, and I just use this one. This is a, this is a $3 one, because I'm wanting to show off to you people. So here's a laser pointer. And I just, I mounted it on some screws, a bolt, just to make a little stand for it, see? There it is. There's a the laser pointer. And I put a clothespin on there to hold it, to turn it on so that it will stay on. It's good. And then I found a syringe. You could do it with a medicine dropper. And I just went down the street to the creek, the pond, and got a drop of, I filled this with pond water, right? And squeeze, squeeze the uh, syringe so one drop will hang on the bottom of that syringe. Or you could use a medicine dropper. All you have to do is take a medicine dropper, a, a pipette, and put a drop of water in front of the laser pointer. So the laser beam will shoot through the drop. And then we had, no, I'm not going to do that right now. But I, I put some white paper here. I would do it for you now, but you, but you can't see it. And I would shoot the laser at this piece of white paper, maybe two or three feet away, through the drop of water. And the laser light, well, and here's, where was that pond water? Hand me that pond water. Here's the pond water right here. You zoom in on that. It's the pond water that I got. And I don't see a darn thing in there. It just, I just got some pond water. And I can't, I really, well, I don't see anything in there. But when I shoot the laser light through there, show, show, show them the video of what we just shot a little while ago. That's what showed up on this piece of paper. I don't know, what are you looking at? Isn't that amazing? Now, those are daphnia, you know, water fleas, and uh, all sorts of protozoa going on. And I, I built that for a dollar and fifty cents, you know, a dollar to make that. And that's one activity out of two hundred that we're going to challenge kids to do to make their own little cheap little micro projector and see what kind of critters, what kind of creatures live in the water or near their house. You know, just got to get pond water. And it's this amazing activity. I see Chris, Crystal, Christoph is impressed. He's smiling. All right. So this is just, yeah, this is just one activity. Now imagine if a kid had access to 200 activities or 300 of these. And uh, that's what I want to do. So I've got a few minutes left. Let me see what I, I don't even know where I'm at on my agenda. Do I have any slides left? Did I not talk about anything? Uh, thinking about the time, Chris, and your face Oh, yeah. I'm going to show you the last. Here's my goal, that last picture. This is the way I think children should feel about learning science. This is a famous picture. Mr. Wizard used it all the time. Let's throw that picture up on the screen. So that is my goal right there. Now, I'm just at the other end of the spectrum of Jay and that, that thinking. These are students of yours about 15 years before they reach you, Jay. 
okay? But I, you see, some of those kids are terrified of what they're seeing. Some of them are excited. That one guy's raising, he's so excited, and they're screaming or yelling, and they're, or they're terrified. What, but, but their brains are involved. And that's the age group that I want to reach, is fourth graders right at that trending point. So I guess what I'm asking is, if any of you uh, would like to consult with me on this, I, will, uh, I don't know how we'll share emails and that sort of thing. Um, I'll depend on Chris, we'll figure that out. But if any of you would like to, to join in this activity, uh, I would appreciate it. And, oh, look, very interesting, great, awesome. Okay. Yeah, you're getting, you're getting some responses. You, oh, they are awake. They are awake. You're, well, you're talk, resonating. We got 10 minutes to talk. Does anybody want to talk about anything? I don't, I could say, I oh. want your input. It, so, it, and maybe so, not tonight necessarily, but anytime. Yeah. If somebody has a question, you could probably raise raise your hand using um, a reaction, and then um, Sung Woo, could you uh, turn them on? And can you monitor how? Uh, who, okay. Who would anyone like can. Uh, okay, Chris. Uh, anyone can. Uh, Anyone can unmute themselves if they want to, and if they oh, have- Oh, great. Yeah, yes, okay, please unmute yourself and go ahead. Thank you. And it's okay to say too that I'm completely nuts and probably should not do this. It might be a waste of time. I would like that input as well, you know. Hey, I Jake. figured Mr. Park was my inspiration too because he was he took a little piece of plastic and turned the world upside down with it, you know. And so I thought, well, if he can do that with a little, with a little plastic bit, I could probably do something with this. I think Mike had a question. Hey, Mr. Wizard, it's Mike Achera. Yes, uh, you got to come on my podcast with Chris sometime. Uh, I'd love to interview you. Well, thank you. You're welcome. I, that'd be fantastic. I love everything I you're saying. Yeah, I did not know. So I, I got another friend, Chris. I yeah. He just stuck his foot right in his mouth. I so used right to, now, um, I, okay. I used to, I used to be a, a scout master and, uh, I, I was old school. We had the Smokey the Bear hats and I taught, we made Morse code machines and we built fires. We built teepees, bridges. We had axes and knives and it was just getting out in nature and, and tearing things up and building things. And the kids loved it. Some of these kids went on, some of them are doing research now, uh, winning awards, doing research in, uh, nanotech and stuff. And they come back and say, man, those, that, those boy scout years really were so important to me. So it does work. Yeah. And there, there are army surgeons saying now that there's ki these kids are coming out of medical school and they're out in the field and they're, and they're doing triage on soldiers and Marines and they can't use their hands. They don't, they can't negotiate three dimensional space. They can't tie knots. They don't know how to cut. It's like what happened kids in this generation, they can't use their hands and they don't understand three dimensional space. It's probably because they weren't in scouts and they didn't live on a farm and they were playing video games. So uh, that's my two cents. I, from my experience, everything you said resonates with me. Mike, you should have spoken my behalf. See, I'm not, dang, I need to have you change your name to Jake Wizard 4 and, and uh, we, we don't want to let this guy go. Okay, Mike's so good, I don't need the rest of you, I guess. Mike was so good, that was great. No, no, v, VG Govender says he's, he's in, he's from, he's from South Africa and he sent his email address and wants, wants to join. Thanks. Um, I appreciate it. Uh, Philippe I, I Longchamps from, from Sweden can't speak right now, but he would also love to be engaged and involved. Um, he's got a, he, he's, he's on camera, but he can't speak. Okay. I'm sorry, Philippe. That's cool. But you've got a neat name. So you're in <laughs> that's, you know, with, with a name like that, I can't say anything. And with Christoph, I'd love to, Steve, I love to yeah, hear yeah. Talk. I <laughs> hello, 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 Steve. Do hello. you hear me? Okay, yeah, I hear you. Uh, yeah, I'm calling from the land of Angry Birds, you know, from Finland, and I'm so happy to hear that you just founded the 
club of angry scholars and angry artists. So here's the army for you, the, ba the band of 200 or, or even more, 20,000. Yeah. And this is wonderful idea. And uh, I just want to also influence you a bit that uh, mathematics and art connections also have great potentials to uh, do make discoveries uh, based on inexpensive materials. So uh, we okay. have a wonderful, wonderful people here also in this conversation and also in our network and we will do our best uh, to collect uh, you also uh, these ideas. Uh, so this is fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, well, thank you. Thank you, Christoph. Oh, I'm, I'm going to come to F Finland for a visit. I want to see. Yes, the birds. absolutely. And uh, you must know that um, at least in Europe, uh, Finnish education is the home of this so-called phenomenon-based learning. So it's really yes. a great uh, harbor uh, for your for your thoughts, and all these ideas are very uh, well not only promoted but um, but done in in basic education. So there are many subjects and 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 many opportunities to try things, uh, hands-on things, and, and do these experiments, but we, we would need more. So your inspiration are really needed here too. Yes. Oh, yeah. And so I, welcome. Yeah, welcome to I, Finland. Well, thank you very much. I thank you. I'm scared to death too. I don't know exactly what I'm doing, but you know, we're, we're going to do it. <laughs> Great. We're do it. How can, how can I, uh, uh, Chris, can I get well, all these comments? Are those savable or? Yeah. I am copying. I am, I am copying uh, emails out of these out of this chat okay. right now. So, you know. So, pardon me. Pardon me for not talking too much. I'm also busy. Uh, oh, I want to invite. I, I want to invite everybody. We, when we do the debut of this in London, and we're gonna, the folks, the folks at uh, at the Royal Institution are so enamored with it that I we get to make the Royal Lecture in September of uh, twenty two. So I've got till then to get it going, or I'll be in trouble. So uh, we'll, we'll get it the, done in London, and we'll get it done. We will. I talked so, Chris into it, and, and everybody said if they could talk Chris into it, anything could happen. You never know. So you mentioned you to me know. in our conversation, you have a you have a unique uh, rating system for the activities that you want to include. They have to have at least a, a full SPE. Is that correct? Yes. Well, yes. Uh, I I ask that the the, the uh, 12 Nobel Prize winners on our advisory group, Mr. Wizard. It wasn't me, it was Mr. Wizard. What they did is children that got them interested in science. Do you remember what it was? What gave you that first buzz, that first delight in science? And of the 12 Nobel Prize winning scientists, 11 of them said almost the same thing, and nine of those said exactly the same thing. And those nine got spanked for it. Now, this is back when children got spanked. But they got spanked for doing this activity that got them uh, excited about science. What activity do you think it was that a 10-year-old would be doing, but they got in trouble for it? Well, of course, they were all playing with matches. And their parents would catch them playing with matches out behind the barn or something like that. And I remembered, I, I loved matches when I was a kid, and my mom would hide them, my dad was a friend. Matches were the thing. I said, well, we don't want to encourage kids to play with matches, of course. That's a, but I'll tell you this story real quick, and then I'll come back to the other part. I was at a conference uh, when Linus Pauling was alive, American Chemical Society, and I asked him that question, what did you do as a child? Do you remember what it was? He said, oh, clearly. I remember my uncle told me, this is Linus Pauling, two Nobel Prizes, chemistry and peace. What, what, what did you do? He said, my uncle told me that if I took a book of matches and laid it on an anvil and hit it with a hammer, it would blow up. And it did. 
So there we were, American chemists. What do you think all the chemists did when they got home? I started looking for a book of matches, and I took it out in the garage and hit it with a hammer, and it did blow up if you hit it just right. Well, I realized we couldn't teach kids to blow up matches, so I thought, well, there's got to be a scale here because it's got to be as much fun as something, and I thought of stink bombs. Because I learned how to make a stink, you know, something that smell bad. So, so we made the SBE scale, stink bomb equivalency. So each one of the act, each one of the 200 activities has to have an eight or better on the SBE scale. So it's got to be as captivating, as much fun as a stink bomb without actually making the stink or burning down the barn. It's got to be as much fun as that. So they will be fun, but we won't use the word fun in because uh, science is beyond fun. You know, fun's in the yeah. rear view mirror of science. Yeah. Yeah. Look at all these people. Yeah. People raising their hands. Okay. Steve, Steve, uh, do you yeah. have an experiment what you are most looking forward to uh, in your program? Maybe what you always wanted to try, but you never managed to, to try, but you are really waiting for in, in your show. Oh, in the show, an experiment that I want to do. Well, yeah. it has nothing to do with the Fair 200 because this isn't an, an experiment that kids could do. You're talking about one kids could do or one I would personally like to do. You, Christine. yeah, you are most interested. Uh, yeah, yeah, you. Okay, do you know what an iodine clock reaction is? It, it simply you mix two clear liquids together and they, after a certain period of time, they will change colors. It'll go it'll pour two clear liquids together, and it's an iodine uh, clock, with iodate to iodine, and there's uh, starch in there, and it turns just like that. It turns dark, and I want to set up forty of those and have them timed to go off with music. The eighteen twelve overture. Every time a cannon fires, I want that one of those things. So before I die, that's on my bucket list, is to set up the, the 1812 Overture iodine clock reaction. I, okay. I don't know. Sounds fun. So there is a question, well, Jordy. Jordy? Yeah. Uh, good morning from Serbia, from uh Balkans and thank you Mr. Wizard for this beautiful um, lecture and uh very good points I, I wanted uh just to uh, share some um impressions uh uh, uh I like your ex uh, so I, I'm talking about experience of uh, Serbian countries uh, of former Yugoslavia. So once uh, 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 we had uh, such experiments even in kin in kindergarten, but as you yes, pointed at some moment, people started to hurry and the exactly same. Uh, things happen uh, 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 here, and I think that another uh, that uh, the crucial um, problem is uh, that uh, uh, although we are talking about very simple stuff, chief stuff, uh, people, uh, educators, uh, parents, even uh, children are now uh, lazy. Um, yeah. to think about uh, and, and to be involved in uh, uh, um, uh, um, activities like this. So our, uh, in Serbia, we have uh, a lot, of, not a lot, but de there is a group of very enthusiastic uh, teachers who are doing incredible, incredible things. But the problem is that uh, all those talk about STEM and uh, whatever code standards, they're only limited to a uh, narrow number of children and in the end uh, uh, depend on uh, if is teacher or 
some uh, person yes. involved in the process uh, motivated or, or not. So I, I think what yeah. they're doing is excellent because instead of writing documents, I would say that it is much better to have a book or even uh, some YouTube channel and promote it and show uh, 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 how experiments uh, can be done and uh, much of those things can even be uh, put uh, in the kid in the kindergarten because uh, uh, yes. yeah thank you that yeah. was I just wanted no, that's to that's great and, you, and your, your English was good thank you I understood you thank you yeah thank you very uh, much Jordi thank you Jordi uh, there's one more question and then we need to pass it off to to Mr. Park but sure. uh, Nico Govender had uh, had a question hi good morning Good morning, Jake and the hey. other colleagues uh, from South Africa. I'm from South Africa. I just wanted to ask Jake this question. I saw in your slides you had uh, something on teachers, teacher development. And you know yes. true well that, you know, the teachers uh, are involved, you know, they have to cover the curriculum. So I want to ask this question yes. in terms of how do you balance covering the curriculum and making science interesting? especially in the junior grades. Uh, what would be the key there? Because um, teachers always complain that they have a curriculum and they must complete A, B, and C, and you know they don't have time to make science interesting. What advice would you have to have a balance between covering of the curriculum and making science interesting and meaningful in the classroom? Well, that, that is a great question because one of the things we've decided to do with this program is we've talked to hundreds, well, I'd say thousands of teachers, they said, well, while we can, what we're going to do will not take the place of a curriculum. We, the, we know most of the curriculums and what are in them, and it's very identifiable. But what we're asking teachers to share is what are your pain points? What, are there any particular points in your curriculum where you feel uncomfortable, that you can't teach that, or it's, it's causing you grief to do it? You know, you're, just, you're not doing it well. These activities will be de designed to meet those pain points specifically. So that, that's why I put a picture of a Swiss army knife up is that these little tools that will, these will also be tools for teachers. We're gonna give a teacher the equivalent of, a, of a, an incredible science activity for every day of the school year. So you'll have two or 300 to pick from. And those, and, and believe me, we are going to make sure these address the learning, the learning goals of any science curriculum in, in, in primary and junior and middle school and that sort, that, that age group. Because I don't think it's that, you're right, the teachers are under so much pressure to perform, to get to reach certain goals and objectives for their classroom and they don't have to time. They don't have time. They don't have time to, to do all this kind of stuff. Well, we're going to do it. For, we're going to do some of that for them. The, you know, we're going to make, we're going to provide this. Uh, we, hopefully, they'll they'll have these 200 activities either on video, so we can do them for them, or they can copy us and do it themselves in the classroom. We'll do all the leg work. We'll do all the preparation work, so they don't have to to. Uh, that's the gift we're going to give to teachers that are in that predicament anyway. We're going to be a, a, a resource. And the nice thing is we've got so many of them. I feel very wealthy. I, I feel like we've got the, the king's treasury of science activities. So it's, it's just a matter of distribution now, I think. But I tell you what, though, the answer your question probably directly, if I, if I had the answer for that, your question, you and I would both be very wealthy. <laughs> Thank Everybody's you. suffering with that same question. You know. uh, Jake, I, thank you. Yeah. I just I want to want to just say thank you very much. We gotta go. I know. Yeah, I want to hand this over to uh, Mr. Park. Uh, wanted to had had a few words that he wanted to give to us all, and and then thank um, you. And thank it. you for accommodating the windbag. I appreciate it. Yeah. Uh. Yeah, I know. I think oh, it was, Mr. Park. 
아, 안녕하세요. 포디 수리학 창의연구소 박호걸 소장입니다. 이번 달에는 아시아와 미주 대륙 청중들을 고려한 새로운 시간대를 시도해 보았습니다. Hello everyone. Uh, I'm Hogal Park, director of the Foley Mathematical Science and Creativity Research Institute. This month, we have tried a new time zone focusing on audiences living in Asia and the Americas. 예, 오늘 행사에 참여해 주셔서 대단히 감사드리며 유익한 시간이 되셨기를 바랍니다. Thank you very much for joining us today. I hope you enjoy today's session. 예, 저희가 발송되는 뉴스레스를 통해 다음 행사 안내 등 새로운 소식들을 계속 받아보실 수 있습니다. 감사합니다. Stay tuned to our news email newsletter so that you can join us the next time as well. Thank you very much again. Thank you, Mr. Park. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. <laughs> Thank you, Sung Woo. Have a good night or have a good day, wherever you are. <laughs> that's it. Welcome the day, you early birds. And uh, good night to us. Good morning, good Bye. night, or good afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> so, Goodbye. See you soon. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Christoph. Thank you.